Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello, hello.
Welcome, welcome. Coming to you live from the great metropolis of Greenfield, California. Still lots of people joining. Did everybody get your bags? Your bags full of science? Has everybody had a chance to take them apart and, and play with stuff? Right. Hello. 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 Yeah. Um, hello. I would just, um, I read through the, I read through the, um, through some of the, uh, whatchamacallit, through some of the, uh, uh, the literature and um, we do, we are working, actually just got off some of the kids. Of course, I didn't get one for me, but I used the makeshift one. Here's my, uh, here's my, uh, the thing that represents my, um, that represents my, my, uh, my greenhouse. This is like my, my little thing to do the, the little uh, bricks of, uh, of soil. And these are my makeshift seeds. And I told the kids how to do it, how to plant them, and then um, how to, you know, water them for like four minutes and da-da-da-da-da. And then eventually, how to put them in, you know, into the little makeshift box, one, two, three, four. And then eventually at one point they have, uh, they might have a little plant. So I just got through explaining that to one of my classes. I did that yesterday and I did that today. So it's in the process. Some kids kind of went ahead of their time, ahead of time. And they do see some growth. They do have some growth, and I'm all just let it happen, let it be. I told them that if they do decide at one point, do not yank your little plant because that's going to be really, um, really tender roots. It'll be over. And if anything, they could plant it in a planter or plant it in the ground. You make a hole, you put it in the ground, and you see your little plant grow. That's what I've done. David, what uh, what school are you at? Uh, VRB. VRB, and you you got fifth graders. Um, fourth and fifth. Fourth and fifth, because you're talking about the fifth grade kits, the fifth grade bags full of science. Yeah. yeah. And that's uh, that was the uh, the other program we had, uh, which was great. And there were three kits, and one of them was uh, planting seeds and, and watching them grow. Uh, but we're gonna we're not gonna talk about that today. But that was oh, fascinating. Oh, oh, sorry. You had a you had a fake plant. You made a virtual plant there and planted it. In a, I wasn't giving I wasn't giving one to uh, present to the kids <laughs> how to make, how to improvise. So it was a fake plant in a tape in a roll of tape planted in a in a little wipey thing, and it still grew. That's amazing. I think you should publish. This is like new science. I've never seen that before. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm going to get a bound periodical, definitely. <laughs> Wow, no, that's great. Um, uh, we, yeah, we had uh, that program with VRB and uh, Montebella where the fifth graders did uh, three projects that were, um, those were focused on the fifth grade NGSS standards. Um, of course, anybody can learn from them. So that was good. But um, the one, the three we've got today in these bags are the, uh, the Stomp Rocket. You can see I've got it. I got two. Uh, I got. I'm here twice. I'm here with Curtis Gabrielson. By the way, I'm Kurt from the Greenfield Community Science Workshop. Hi, Kurt. Uh, and uh, and then I'm also at the Greenfield CSW iPhone, where I should be able to show you some of the stuff that that you need to see. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, taking full charge here. I'm going to mute you, David, just because uh, I want everybody. Uh, <laughs> Everybody to hear. Um, 
and uh, it's good to see you all. I'm not sure how many there's supposed to be, but it's, it's five after five now. So, so we'll start. And um, uh, first of all, I hope you got the news that it's all on YouTube. There's videos on how to do each one of these things. And there's also write-ups. So um, I've got the, uh, here, let me share my screen. Screen. Okay. Um, uh, I gave you a link to uh, to our uh, Google Drive, and here you've got a. Uh, uh, this is a document, and then there's three videos. There, oh no, it's three documents that are the uh, individual documents. And if you go to that first document, it's got links to everything. It's a, it's a Google Doc and you can see, can everybody see that? Can everybody see my screen? Yeah, got it. So there's three projects. Uh, you might think the projects would be labeled one, two, and three, but you'd be wrong. They're labeled 13A, 28, and 37A. Uh, and that's because these are projects we've done over the last year when we made, um, projects for down here in Greenfield and or in South County, we actually serve uh, Soledad and King City and San Ardo and San Lucas. And we've made over 60,000 of these bags over the last year of, uh, of COVID. Uh, so, and now we're, we're branching out into Salinas. So we're very happy about that. But here they are, number 13, A is the mini stomp rocket. You can see the video and the write-up. And the next one is the video and the write-up and the video and write-up. So you go there and you get uh, the write-up is is just a, a really basic one pager you can see the materials which uh, should be in the bag and then to do and notice that's how to build it and then what's going on and then you got the a uh, little bit of the science background if you want to focus on the science concept even some vocabulary down there at the bottom okay and it's in espanol también se puede enseñar en espanol uh, and so that's more for the teachers, but the older students could also be given that. And if they want to read or, or learn the vocabulary, that's fine. And um, con yeah, you there's can stop me if you have any questions anytime. Uh, my name is Miss Solis, but is there a way that you can share the link one more time? Because I don't have access to that. Okay, I'm going to put the link in the chat. Thank you so much. This is the drive link. Actually, let me let me do it right here. Yeah, link. Okay. I sent these to the uh, assistant principals, but assistant principals get busy sometimes. Okay, I'm gonna stop share. I'm gonna go to the chat, uh, and here is. The link, I hope. Try that. See if you can get there. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to share screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Thank okay. you. Share screen again. And so that's about the write ups. And each one of the write ups is about just about the specific project that it is. Okay, they're made in uh, Word. So when they come out in Google Docs, they may be a little bit messed up with the format but you could download them in Word also if you want. Now, uh, the, the videos, uh, you should tell the students to go watch the videos. They can get a lot from the videos. And to find the videos, you can scan the little code on the side of your bags if you know how. And that's, that'll take you right there to our playlist. If you don't, you can, uh, you can always find it. We're, uh, Greenfield CSW, that's our channel, our YouTube channel, Greenfield CSW. And then you, uh, you go to playlists. Now, just a year ago, I didn't even know what a playlist was, but now we've got all kinds of playlists on our channel and our playlist is Alisa Union ACES, okay? Oh, by the way, David, 
your playlist is down here uh, with uh, fifth grade, fifth grade bags full of science. That's got all of yours in it. Uh, but these three are in Alisa Union ACES view full playlist. And there they are. So these are the videos we made and it's got um, myself and one of our assistants here. And you can watch it. And uh, the important thing is that we show you how to do it. And the part where we show you how to do it is, uh, is without words. So you don't need words. And in fact, the kids can watch it with their families. Everybody can, everybody can see how to do it. So you can watch that and learn how to do it. And then when that's over, then we start talking about it. And sometimes we talk for a long time. These are the early videos where we're talking and talking, me in English and uh, Maria or Giovanna in Spanish. And then sometimes we have videos, related videos we'll show you as well. And little video links and stuff. Uh, so that's, some of them are like that. And others of them are shorter and they, they just have how to do it and then the science concepts. So uh, for example, the circuit card here, this just shows you how to do it and then it cuts straight to uh, um, uh, Giovanna and I circuits, telling you how to do it. Okay. And, yeah. and then also okay. some concepts. You turn off the lights. Also some concepts coming on the screen like that. Uh, all right, so that's that's what you can show the kids. You can send the kids to do that, and uh, they should be able to get a lot of it themselves. In fact, you shouldn't have to like teach them anything. They can they can figure out how to do it and then do it. In fact, you can be uh, like the cheerleader. You can be the the uh, let's go do it. Let's go do science. Go figure this stuff out and make it happen. And then let them go. And then maybe the next day or an hour later or something, then you say, okay, come back and show us how it went. Maybe you got it finished. Maybe you ran into a problem, but then you come bring them back together. And then, then you don't have to sort of step-by-step step go through the whole thing. You can get them going already. And then you can just focus on the, the difficult problems they had. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so that's the basic uh, that's the basic idea of how to do it. You could do them one at a time. On the other hand, if you if you pass out the bags, they'll have all three of them. So they should have access to those three videos so they know how to, to, to deal with it. Some of these houses, uh, like my own house, for example, are a little chaotic. And so when the bag is open, you can bet that those parts go everywhere. Uh, so you want them to, you know, don't, uh, it's not going to work to say now today we're going to do the second one but don't touch the other two you know you they're gonna they're gonna want to you know try them all probably and if they open one then they're going to start losing parts so uh, sort of be ready for that uh, but there's no reason to hold back they can do them all anytime they want and then you as a teacher you can bring them back and say well today we're going to discuss this one so be sure and come with with whatever happened when you tried to do this one all right are there any questions so far about the logistics or how this will be rolled out or not, not just questions, but ideas or suggestions that we could all learn from each other or think about this together? Let me ask you this. How many of you have actually sent out the, the bags? Like the kids came and got the bags and, and, and got going. You could raise your hands. All right, sweet. Okay. Still people coming into the waiting room. Okay. Okay, and have you had any feedback? Have you had any Parents say, this is fabulous, or this is terrible, or uh, uh, my child launched a rocket into the electric lines or something, nothing like that. 
Okay. Okay, well then I, I was gonna go through the, the, the projects one by one and just sort of show uh, some of the, um, some of the finer points or some of the, the interesting things. And um, it's good to, uh, it's good to remember that uh, these are science projects. They're, they're connected to the NGSS, but perhaps for ACES, for after school, that doesn't matter at all. Because what the kids are gonna learn mostly is how to build something and how to problem solve and how to get something stuck together and make it work. And then how to explore and investigate and have fun. And also there's uh, some art involved here too. They can make it look, uh, certainly the card, they can make it look beautiful. They can do it the way they want. And each one of these projects should be uh, considered as the beginning of a uh, possible exploration. Once you've got uh, once you've got the basic thing going, you can do other experiments or other activities with it. Uh, this stomp rocket, for example, I can teach for a week on on the, the, the concepts or the activities around the stomp rocket, uh, and and nobody gets hurt. Uh, uh, you can do it uh, inside and outside. You got you got to put the little puff ball on the end, but uh, it's they're they're sort of safe exploratory activities and if the kid has a new idea or wants to do it completely different that's great in fact if it's really good you could tell all the other kids and everybody can try that idea and if it's really really good you got to tell me so i can tell all the other kids down here in south county and we can all do it so basically this is a uh, exploration and uh tinkering and make something interesting in whatever way you want, okay? All right, so we'll start with the stomp rocket. You can see that you have to supply your own bottle. You have to get a, get a bottle. I think there's so many of these around, that's not a problem. And then you have to tape it on so that it's pretty airtight. You can figure out if it's airtight by blowing on it. And usually if the stop rocket is not working, it's because the air is leaking out here or it's leaking out here uh, or the bottle's got a leak. Other than that, it's, it's gonna work. So basically you, you, you build the, the launcher and you see how the sticks are, are uh, taped together. So it's long, that's so you can stand up and kind of aim it. So you're aiming this thing and then you smash the bottle. Uh, and the rocket, yeah, the rocket right here is made from the little straw and it's got a little tail. The tail makes it nice to look at and it's easier to follow when it's got a tail. Uh, but your students might realize that the tail is actually slowing it down. <laughs> if you want your rocket to go the fastest, take off the tail. Uh, but don't take off the little ball. The little puff ball makes it safe. So if it hits something, uh, just just randomly happens to hit your little brother or sister, it doesn't hurt. It just, uh, just bounces off, no problem. Uh, and it does have a little piece of a hot glue in the top. Before you put the puff ball on, you put the hot glue. That's important. And so you might notice that the weight of the rocket is almost all in front. I'm balancing this with my finger and the weight of the rocket is all in the front. Well, that's how real rockets work as well. The, the balance is such that the weight is all in the front and, and the resistance is in the back. Instead of fins, like most rockets have little fins at the end, this one's got the tail. And so it's the resistance is in the back of the rocket and the weight is in the front. And that's what makes it go straight. Okay, so then once you've got it working, you can go all kinds of places. You can talk about why it's working. Why, why is this thing moving? How is this thing flying? Where does it get its force? Where does it get its energy? Uh, well, you stepped on this, you stomped on this thing or smashed this with your hand. And then the rocket came flying out of the tube. 
Well, that's kind of cool right there because you didn't touch the rocket. The rocket went flying without you ever touching it. All of the force that sent that rocket flying was transferred by whatever was in that bottle. Now the bottle's empty, right? It's an empty bottle, right? Wrong, it's full of air. The bottle is full of air. And we know that because the air pushed the rocket up, right? If there was nothing in the rocket, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have gone anywhere. But because the rocket goes flying, then we know that the, the, the bottle there was full of air. And when we smashed it, the air had to escape and escape down the black tube, down the white tube, and then it ran into the rocket. And it still wanted to escape, so it pushed on the rocket and the rocket took off, All right? So that's the basic, without using any fancy language about force or pressure or volume or uh, fluid dynamics, that's what made the rocket go. Now, this whole thing is about all those things. And if you want to use that terminology with the older kids so they hear it, yeah, go for it. Uh, when you squeeze the bottle, you're increasing the pressure. When you increase the pressure, then the air in the bottle is going to go to a place with less pressure. That is out here in the air. So, so first you, you apply the force, you increase the pressure. And then the air starts flowing from high pressure to lower pressure. Uh, by the way, that's what causes wind. Wind is blowing from a high pressure to a lower pressure. So basically you're making wind here and you can make wind right in your face. You can feel the wind made from smashing the bottle. Okay, so that's about how it works. Now you can also uh, look at the flight of the rocket. The rocket goes in a pathway that, that goes like that. It starts here, goes up, and it comes back down. That's a very special path. It's a very special shape. The shape is a parabola. It's called a parabola. It's the same shape as uh, when somebody does a Hail Mary football throw. It goes up and down. That's, it's, not a, it's not a circle. Like a rainbow is a circle. It's part of a circle. But this is a parabola. It's a different shape. It's kind of pointier at the top. And it's symmetric. It goes up the same way it comes down. In fact, anything you throw on Earth is going to travel in the shape of a parabola. So you could just ask the kids, what, what is that? Do you see how that thing is moving? What's the shape that it always, unless you launch it straight up, in which case it's just a straight line goes up and back down. Uh, any other angle that you shoot it at, it's going to follow a parabola. And that's that's the way it works on Earth. Gravity's pulling down and it's pulling the thing back down. And, and then it's also moving forward. So it has this downward force and this forward motion. And that ends up making this parabola. Okay. Now, obviously, uh, you want to figure out how to get this thing to go as far as possible. So <clears throat> you could launch it at all different angles. You could launch it at a low angle like that. You could launch it at a high angle. You could launch it exactly in the middle. That would be a 45 degree angle. And you could figure out which one of those makes the rocket go the farthest. All right, so there's a little bit of math involved there. Okay, straight up, is that's not gonna go very far. It's gonna come right back down. And straight out, okay, well that might be, but when it comes out, it's gonna start going down immediately. So I don't know if that's gonna be the, the farthest. So there's some other angle in there that's gonna make it go the farthest. So you can ask the kids about that. They have enough stuff to, to, uh, to build one rocket. They could build more rockets if they want. Well, no, actually, I think they have enough stuff to build two rockets, but they could build more rockets, right? You just go get yourself a little bubble tea or whatever you get little straws like this and, um, and then some tape and you can make more rockets and you could launch them all at different angles and figure out which angle is the best. Okay, finally, uh, one more concept you could talk about is how is this rocket different from real rockets? Uh, well, a real rocket is, uh, is burning something. 
right? There's something spewing fire and smoke out the bottom of it, right? So that's quite different. That stuff that's burning, that's actually giving it a force. And the force keeps on going. The farther it goes up, the more force it's, it's getting. Okay, it's being pushed all the way up into the atmosphere or over, over the seas or wherever it's going. What about this one? Where's the push coming from for this one? It's coming from our bottle. We already talked about that, right? It's coming from the bottle and, and it's just the air. So the minute it comes out of the top of the tube here, the air is pushing the, the, the rocket and, and then it goes about this far away and now the air doesn't even touch the rocket anymore. So there's no more push. So as soon as it comes out and it leaves the end of the tube like that, that's as fast as that rocket is ever gonna go. The rocket starts slowing down at that point. And if you shoot it straight up, it's gonna slow down more and more and more and more and stop and then turn around and then gravity is gonna pull it right back down to earth. Okay, so that's the main difference. This, this rocket here, we could call it a rocket because it goes flying, but it's actually more like a bullet. When a bullet comes out of a gun, that's as fast as it's ever gonna go. Right when it comes out of the barrel of the gun, it starts slowing down. It doesn't get going faster and faster. It starts slowing down because there's no more push. All the push was back here in the barrel. I don't like talking about guns, but uh, this is physics, right? So we have to make the comparison to, to real life. Any cannon or gun or a, a throwing machine, or when you throw, when you throw a football or a baseball, right when you let go of the ball, that's as fast as that ball is gonna go. Then it, it hits the air and the gravity starts pulling it and it starts slowing down. Slows down all the way until it hits something else and then, and then it can stop. Okay, so there's a few things you can talk about. Please don't feel like you have to teach physics to the kids. If they don't learn any physics, that's fine because they're, they're experiencing the physics. Just by building this thing, they're being engineers. And then if they start thinking about how it works, they're being physicists, okay? That's the important thing. The experience is number one. And if they get it out and try it, then you're 100%. That's 100% success, All right? Then later, you know, some year in the future when the physics teacher is trying to teach them about projectile motion or force and gravity and everything, then maybe they'll remember, oh yeah, there's that rocket and we did this and, and that experience will become very valuable because very likely that physics teacher won't have time to do an interesting thing like this. They'll be chasing after the standards and uh, the kids won't learn it if they, if they haven't had this experience. All right, so experience is the key here. And fun, fun too, don't forget the fun. Okay, any questions or comments about the rocket, Stomp Rocket Project? Don't be shy if you missed something or you, don't, you didn't get it or you had some some other crazy idea, just let me know. By the way, I'm gonna put my um, contact information in the chat. So if you do have questions later, if some kid asks you something and you, you wanna know more, you can feel free to contact me or if some kid comes back and says, oh, I didn't, get my, I didn't get the right stuff and you don't have any bags left, well, call me up, I'll bring you more stuff. So you can, you can get the kids what they need, all right? So feel free to contact me there. All right. No questions? Okay, all right, so there's the, I mean, do, I was joking about the safety, but do tell them 
not to shoot people, all right? I mean, usually we say, don't shooting somebody that doesn't want to be shot, because actually it's quite fun to get shot once in a while, but um, that's sort of standard politeness. Some of our kids may not have learned that you don't want to shoot somebody that doesn't want to be shot, even with a little stomp rocket like this. Uh, but we've never had any injuries with this. We have broken things though. So uh, it might be good to go outside uh, once you got it working. <laughs> Okay, uh, by the way, I had a little bottle there, a little water bottle. Uh, it's gonna work better with a bigger bottle. If they got a two liter bottle, one and a half liter, two liter bottle, that's it. Three liters, maybe even better. That's no excuse to be drinking that much soda, but uh, you know, if they happen to find the bottle around, they could get a bigger bottle. Okay, now the next one I wanna show you is the, uh, the brine shrimp one. And this one's obviously related to biology. And you have to provide, for this one, you have to provide salt. You have to get some salt and water, warm water. And it says, I think one tablespoon of salt or half a tablespoon of salt or something. It doesn't matter. These brine shrimp are not picky. They're not picky uh, swimmers. If you think about it, they came from the uh, Great Salt Lake in Utah. And uh, that lake, changes in the salinity of the water. In the summer, when the sun is really beating down, the water evaporates and there's more salt, so more concentration of salt. And then in, in the winter, if they get rains or the snow melt in the spring comes, then the, the uh, salt concentration goes down. And it's not like the shrimp all die off, they, they adapt. They can handle a lot of salt or a little salt and, and they make it. So, um, my water is here. If you're really clever, you can dump water all over your laptop while you're doing this experiment. Okay. And uh, that's it. That's the whole preparation. Then you dump the eggs in. We've given everybody uh, exactly 3,692 brine shrimp eggs. Uh, if you didn't get your 3,962 brine shrimp eggs, call me, I'll give you a couple more. No, I'm joking. There's, there's thousands of eggs there and uh, you only need like five. <laughs> so, so it's gonna work, all right? So you just dump it in the warm water, it should be warm water, salty water, and, uh, and that's it. No, no, sorry, there's one more thing. So you kind of stir it in, stir it in a little bit. They kind of stick to the stick, but stir it in and then, a straw, the paper straw, and you blow bubbles. If you've ever had a fish tank, you know you have to bubble air through the water. That's because the fish are breathing oxygen, just like us, they're animals. And these brine shrimp are also animals. They're animals like us and they need oxygen. Now there is oxygen in the water, it's dissolved in the water. Usually when we say dissolved, we think of things like salt or sugar or hot chocolate or coffee that get dissolved in the water. But here we're talking about air, which is a gas. And the gas gets dissolved in the water the exact same way. It means it's sitting between the water molecules. There's a little bit of space between the molecules and these things, the, the salt, and the air, the oxygen goes down and takes the space between the molecule. And then these shrimp and fish and stuff like that, they have gills and they can go take that oxygen out of the water and breathe it. But if the water isn't moving, if it's just sitting there, it can lose all the oxygen out of the top of it. And then there's not enough oxygen in there and the fish will die. Out in nature, that's rarely a problem because water is moving and it's and it's splashing and waves are constantly aerating the water and, and making the oxygen go into it. But for this one, if you want your little shrimp to do well, you, you could blow on it every day with your little paper straw. Uh, I hope I don't have to remind anyone that you don't wanna suck on the straw, you wanna blow on the straw because the brine shrimp do not taste good. They're not, they're not hazardous. You could eat them if you want, uh, but I don't recommend it uh, just for the taste sort of, you know, it's not really what you want to have for snack. 
So you blow and the, and the oxygen goes into the water. And then you wait. And in about two days, they hatch. Now that's pretty cool right there because they've been sitting here for months and months. These, this could have been last year's harvest. They harvest these things off the top of the water in the Great Salt Lake. And, uh, and then they dry them all out and they sort them and clean them. And then they just sit there forever. They'll sit there for, they, they've had instances where they found eggs and somehow they figured out that they were thousands of years old, two, 3,000 year old eggs. And they gave them warm salt water and they hatched and they had thousand year old brine shrimp. So how does it know, you know? It's just one of those biological things that's developed over the years where the, the actual shell of that egg can feel. Is this, is this temperature right? Is the moisture right? Am I gonna be able to live? And if the answer is yes, the egg hatches and the brine shrimp starts going. Uh, so that's what we got here. It starts, it starts going in a couple days and then they start developing really fast. Let me share the screen. This is on the video, but I want to show, I want to show you. Um, share the screen here. Uh, these are the stages of the Artemia Salina development. That's Latin, by the way. Uh, the Latin name for brine shrimp. Brine is just salt water. So you see the egg, the egg hatches just like a chicken. If you're watching with a good enough magnifying glass, and this one is probably not, but actually let me stop it. Uh, no, I'm sharing my screen. I'll just go through this again. So if you can watch carefully with your magnifying glass, you can see this, these stages of development. Right here is when you first start seeing legs. Right up to then, it's kind of hard. It's, there's kind of blobs, different shaped blobs. And then here it gets dark yellow and it starts sticking out its legs. And then here, it's a very distinct shape, different from the adult. The adult is what you'll have mostly because they get big and you can see them easy. But there's a small thing you should look for, which is the pupa after the larva. This one's a larva and a pupa. And it has these little wings. You can see it trying to thrash around with these little wings before it gets all these different legs. Okay, so you could actually see these stages of development and it doesn't last very long. By, uh, by one full day, 24 hours after it hatches, it's already an adult. So this, this thing with the two wings, it only lasts about 12 hours. Uh, but, uh, you got several hundred eggs there, so they'll, you'll see all stages of development at any given time. Okay, and then if you can keep it going, and it will, it'll go for months and months, maybe years, if you just keep blowing in it, keep adding water uh, and, uh, and then food, you have to give it some food too. If you just keep doing that, they'll reproduce. They'll get together and make more brine shrimp. They'll lay eggs and the eggs will hatch and you'll get more and more. So you'll see this development over and over. Uh, so that's what you can be looking for. I mean, it's really cool. I hope you can sort of appreciate this without having done it yet, but you just put this, this, uh, uh, these things that look like dust basically on the water and you blew on it. And then it comes alive and these things are swimming around in there and they get bigger and bigger. They get, you know, in the end, they get almost that big. And it's really, it's really pretty amazing. Uh, and, and so that, just that is good enough. But then you want to encourage the kids to, to observe more, you know, check out more. What, what do you notice about them? What can you tell about the behavior of these little creatures? And that's when you want to use this uh, hand lens. One of the, the critical observational tools of a scientist, any kind of scientist. And so basically our eyes have a limitation. They can only see down to so small. And if you use one of these, you can see even smaller. So it's got two, it's got two lenses. That, this is a, a key part. If you don't 
if you don't let the uh, kids know this, they might miss it. The big one is the one everybody sees and they use it, but that's only about two or three power. So it doesn't make things that much bigger. All right, so see, it's, it's making my eye a little bit bigger. But now the little lens here, you see there's this tiny little lens here. This one is about six power. It's much stronger, it's twice as strong as that one. And the way to use the lens is to put it right up to your eye. Put it right up to your eye like this. And then if you're gonna look at something, for example, I'm looking at my finger, which is really interesting. It's like a pretty disgusting, actually. You realize how dirty your fingers are. You thought they were, you just washed them maybe. And then you look at them with this and you're like, what the heck? Because there's still all this dirt on there. Uh, but I, if I want to look at my finger, I'm going to put this thing right on my eye. And then I move my finger back and forth until it comes into focus. And it's going to be pretty close. Okay. So it's, for me, it's that close. And then I see quite a different picture than when I'm just looking at it. Okay. So be sure and teach the kids how to use that high power lens. Uh, because you can see a lot more stuff. And then you'll be able to see the shrimp with that lens, but you have to get right up there to get thing right to, and you can see right through the side of the cup. And I can see these eggs floating around very clearly. Okay. So that's how to use the hand lens. Uh, you can also take it outside and try to start a fire under the sun. It's going to be hard because the lens is a little bit too small, but on a nice hot day, and if you get a, a really dry leaf, it might work. Try not to burn anything down though, okay? Uh, all right, so then another thing you can observe is the, the brine shrimp's response to light. And this is really, it's really cool. You can, almost, uh, you can almost convince yourself that you're training them, all right? So you get a light, you get any light you want, any kind of a light from a, phone or from a, some kind of machine or from, from a flashlight. These are only a dollar, a dollar tree. And then you, you shine it through the cup, right? You see that? Shine it through the side of the cup like that. And they'll come over to it, like you calling them. And you shine it through another side over here and they'll come over there. And then you can, uh, you get these colors. You got some colors in your kit. They're, they're, acrylic gels and you put the flashlight through the color and then you put that up against the side of the cup and then you can compare do they like green better do they like blue better do they like yellow better and we can we've actually been able to convince ourselves that this given cup of shrimp that we're playing with does prefer one of these colors to another color i'm not going to tell you which one I don't want to bias your experiment. But uh, then if you do figure that out, say you figure out they like red better, then you got to think, why would it be that brine shrimp would like red light better than blue light or yellow light better than red light? Well, that's a legitimate question. I mean, that's a question for scientists. That's a question scientists, actual professional scientists, have asked and done experiments to try to find the answers to. And your kids can too. This is the whole point here. It's not that we're studying science or we're talking about science. We're being scientists. When we're doing this, we are being scientists. This is exactly what scientists do. We observe. We describe what we see and talk about it with our colleagues. We design simple experiments. We see what happens. And then we do another experiment. That's science. And these kids can do it. Let me think if there's something else I was going to tell you. Oh, you can do other experiments with them. You can you could cover the thing completely with something black. And then you could blitz them out with a whole bunch of light. They are animals, but they're so, so basic of animals, you don't really have to think about their feelings or, or how they're going to take the uh, results of the experiments. I mean, they're just brine shrimp, right? There's, they're less than, they're simpler animals than mosquitoes, right? So uh, you can see how much they can take. Uh, I taught high school one year and I used these things to try the effects of alcohol and nicotine. 
And nowadays I could get some cannabis and try that. We make a little bit of, uh, of tea. We soak the, soak the tobacco in, in some water and then we prepare a little a spoonful of, of water with the brine shrimp and then we dump the, dump the tea in there and see what happens. It was quite interesting because, um, uh, oh, and caffeine, we tried caffeine too. So caffeine is supposed to be an upper, it's supposed to perk you up and, and alcohol is supposed to be a downer. And so we sat there and watched and, and tried to see if we could see these, just by the, the movements of these brine shrimp, if they were uh, being calmed down by the alcohol and if they were being jacked up by the coffee. Uh, that was a pretty cool experiment. Uh, and then you can also uh, do experiments with the kind of food. You can separate them into different cups and you could give one of them one kind of food and the other the other kind of food. I forgot to mention the food. Um, these things will eat almost anything, you know, anything you've got. But the key is they don't eat hardly anything. I mean, they're only this, there's the size of mosquitoes. So when you feed them, you got to think about in terms of like one drop one little piece of of stuff if you want to feed them lettuce you you give them one little piece of lettuce and you put it in there that's it and then they'll all come over and, and have a bite because if you put a bunch of food if you're thinking if you have if you've had experience with fish and you're thinking oh i'm going to feed the fish and you put a bunch of food in there in a couple of days the water will turn nasty because the food will make it rot basically so um, you got to tell the kids like three times that you can't hardly give them any food at all. And they'll, they'll go for like a week or two with no food. And then, and then they'll start dying, but then they'll start eating each other. So um, yeah, you, you could try different kinds of food, see which one they, they like better or see which one they, they um, uh, multiply better with. Uh, but just, just like one little teeny tiny bit per day. That's all they eat. Okay. I saw some questions in the chat here. Let's see. Temperature water have to stay constant. Uh, yeah, well, it doesn't, this time of year, you don't have to worry about it. It's just it's gonna be fine. Just don't put it, uh, don't put it in the freezer, don't put it in the fridge and, and don't put it directly under the sun. But actually, you know, that's where they lived in Salt Lake City is directly under the sun. So you could try that'd be a good experiment. But we just put it in the corner of the room and uh, forget about it. Uh, and you can forget about it for days, then you come back and blow water in it or blow, uh, blow air in it. And there's still some there and they come back to life and give them a little bit of food and, and they're happy. By the way, this is a very common experiment. You can look online, there's hundreds of pages of information, really interesting stuff. And the pictures, I put a bunch of the videos in the, um, in the, in the video that we made uh, that are all made with microscopes. So you really get the, the full shape of them. Uh, but that's the same thing that's gonna be growing in your, in your cup. What is their life expectancy? Ah, I forgot, I think it's around, I think it's around a week. Like I said, they become an adult after only 24 hours. If only our students would grow up that fast, huh? No, just kidding. Uh, we gotta enjoy childhood while we can. Do you have to blow air every day? No, you don't have to, but but you know, if you wanna if you wanna make a good experiment, whenever you set it up, you have to keep everything stable the whole time. So you have some routine where you blow air in the morning and then you feed it something and then see what happens. Are there any other questions about the brine shrimp activity? The main issue that we had here in South County is the, the kids, or the main challenge for the kids is to find a, a place in the house where it's gonna last, where it's not gonna get knocked over by the dog or thrown away by Tia who says, what is this crap and flushes it down the toilet. You gotta have a safe place because this is science, you know, you gotta have a, a little science 
area in your house, the, every, the, the whole family should know that we're doing an ongoing science experiment here. Uh, and then, then you'll have a chance. If you just leave it on the table, those brine shrimp are doomed. Okay, anything else? I have a question. Um, what if the students want to transfer the shrimp into like another container? Is that an okay thing to do? Like say, for example, they want to like grab a bowl and, you know, put them in there? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, there's one more thing I didn't show. Oh, I can't find it. It's the, uh, the dropper, the eyedropper. It should be an eyedropper in the bag. And, uh, um, we have found kids just fascinated with eyedroppers. They play with eyedroppers all day long. They're more pretty cool. Uh, and you can use your eyedropper to uh, to try to, yeah, yeah, you've all, you has got them there, uh, to try to get like a single brine shrimp. And then you can put it in a spoon. So if you grab a single one and put it in a spoon and it's got a little water to swim around in, that's how, uh, a lot of times you'll find people looking at them under a microscope. You, you want them, you don't want them swimming around. You want them in one place. And so if you make a little drop of water that's only just slightly bigger than the shrimp, then it's going to stay right there. So you could try to do that in your spoon. And then you've also got it sort of pinned down and you can look at it with your high power magnifying glass. Uh, so yeah, you could do that and you can, I mean, that's, that's sort of one by one. You can try to get the bigger ones because you can see more parts about the bigger ones, but you can also just dump it, you know, just dump it in a two and then add more water and add more salt and, and they'll be fine. Another question. How will the students know if the shrimp have died? Yeah. How do you think? Maybe no movement. Are they visible? Can you see them swimming around? Absolutely, you oh, can okay. see them. You can, and then, and then, I mean, that's the start of a of an enormous discussion, which is what is life? What is life, and how is animal life different from plant life? And is movement? Does movement always mean that something is alive? So big questions. Not, yeah. not uh, trivial at all. They're serious questions. And uh, once again, the process of discussing the question should be the goal for us teachers, not the answer. Don't, don't think you got, don't, everybody here can relax. Maybe you don't have a science background. Maybe you hated science. That's fine. No problem at all. Because here, we don't have to explain anything. You don't have to teach the kids any science at all if you don't want. All you have to do is keep asking questions. And more important is, is to boost up their questions. If some kid has a question, your response should not be an answer. If you give an answer, maybe that's just going to snuff out the question. The kid won't think about it anymore. If a kid has a question, here, let's do this together. Okay, repeat after me. So the kid has a question, the kid asks something. Well, what about, uh, I saw this one brine shrimp swim over to the side and he just sat there. He sat there all day long. What, what's going on with that brine shrimp? Now repeat after me. Yeah, what's going on with that brine shrimp? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to answer. You just repeat the question. You boost up that question. In fact, you could repeat the question to all the other students. Yeah, this kid, what, look at Erica found this brine shrimp swam over in the corner and just sat there. What do you think is going on there? And get them all thinking about that same question. That's what scientists do. If you just go to school and read the textbook and try to get good grades, you could think that science is a bunch of questions with answers. And that to be smart, you have to have all the answers to the questions. Actually, it's not true at all. All of those answers came from doing experiments with real stuff. <laughs> All of those answers came from questions that some scientists somewhere in history had. Oh, what's going on with these? What are these little things moving around in the water? 
I don't know. Let's figure it out. Let's try to raise them. Let's try to change something. Let's see what they need, what environment they like and they don't like. All these questions were asked by real scientists. And then they did experiments and they got the answers. And then they wrote them in a textbook. And then only then did teachers think, oh, well, well, I want my students to know all these answers. And then they start teaching the answers, but maybe the students never even had those questions. Well, that's a big problem. If you try to give answers when there were no questions in the kid's mind, my gosh, who cares? You know, if the, if the student doesn't have a question, you're wasting your time if you give them the answer. Uh, so even when the student does have a question, don't, don't jump to the answer. Let's say you do know the answer. Still, hold back, hold back. Make sure that question is really rooted well before you start getting to the answer. Does that make sense? The bottom line is you can relax. You're the cheerleader. Yeah, what a great question. Oh, that's an amazing question. Oh, that's a great observation. Oh, look at this kid over here. He's got this. See if you can all see it. Could you see that? Did you see that? It's a piece of cake and it's great fun. It's really good fun. And you learn something every time. I've done this hundreds of times and I still learn something when I do it with a new group of students. Okay, uh, let's go to the last one. The last one is the card. If, uh, if you got it out already or if you give it out this week, it can be a Mother's Day card. All right, so uh, it's an electric card. It comes on when you squeeze the button. You pay like $3.75 for one of these at the store, but this one's for free. Okay, and inside you got the little a little circuit and you uh, just stick that that little um copper tape down on the circuit you can see i did mine totally totally erratic i got way off the line doesn't matter at all as long as the circuit comes back around to hit the um the battery with the end with the tail end there okay so here's what's gonna happen. And it's gonna happen with maybe quarter, third, maybe up to a half of your students. They're gonna build it. They're gonna push the button and nothing happens. What's not working? What's not, what, mine's not working. What's going on? Mine's not working. Okay, this is great. Okay, we got, uh, we got uh, education right, just about ready to happen here. So get excited, right? Uh, if it's not working, that means the circuit is not complete. In order to work, that battery, that battery's got two sides and one side has got to be connected through the light bulb all the way around to the other side of the battery. Okay, that's how it works. And you see, yeah, they're, they're called a negative side and a positive side. The names are irrelevant. The important thing is there's two different sides. You can see that the battery is taped down so that the bottom of it, or so that one side of it is on the copper strip at the bottom. And then when you close the top here, you're squeezing the other copper strip onto the top of it. So the cop, so the battery is in a little sandwich of those two copper strips. So maybe it's not making contact there. Maybe the battery is slightly in the wrong place or the copper strips coming in slightly in the wrong place. So you have to change that. Okay, so maybe, that one was the problem, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe the problem was over here at the light. You see the light, the light was taped down. You put the strips on and then you tape the light, the two legs of the light onto those copper strips. Well, push on them. Try to make those connections as good as you can. You don't even have to open it. You could push on it. Once you know where it is, you could push on it from the outside and make sure that the connection is good. And then there's one more thing that's, uh, that's important about this one. That little light is not a regular light. The light is uh, a light emitting diode. A diode is a semiconductor device. Semiconductors are what makes modern computers possible. Diode is the simplest possible one of them. And this one gives off light. And they're very important today. Uh, more and more lights are being made with these diodes 
uh, because they use very little energy. They give a lot of light for a little bit of energy. And so it's, uh, it's being used more and more and it's helping to save the world because uh, all the old lights used, you might, maybe you remember the lights that, that would uh, get really hot. Like you're screwing in a lamp, a lamp light and it's super hot. Well, all that heat is wasted electricity. The electricity went up there. What you wanted was light, but instead you got a bunch of heat. Well, that was a waste. Well, these LEDs, uh, they don't get hot. They don't waste that heat. They're, they're maybe 80, 90% efficient in terms of changing electricity into light. But they have one little quirk. The electricity only goes one way. If you try to put the electricity through it in the other direction, it goes nowhere. It's like a switch. That's what a diode is. It's in one direction, it's an open switch. So the electricity can't go through and in the other direction, it's a closed switch. So if you checked all the connections and made all the connections as good as you can and it's still not working, switch the legs of the light. It's not a problem. You can, uh, you can just pick your watch, watch. I'm going to do it for you right here. Okay. I'm going to switch my light right now. Let's take this, pick off the tape. Okay. And the light comes up. There it is. See, I got my legs, my legs are straight out like that. And I'm going to flip it around the other way, stick it in there and put it down again. You can see in the card it says long leg here, short leg here. Well, that's only if you got the battery right. Because <laughs> there's two things with two sides. The LED has two sides and the battery has two sides. So either one of them could be the wrong way. Uh, but you only have to choose, you only have to flip one of them. And then you're, you're trying the other way. Does that make sense? If you flip one, then the electricity is going in the other direction and, and you're seeing if it, if it works or not. So you, you push it all down nice and tight and then you try it again. Oh, it's not working. Yeah, so that's the wrong way. Okay, I, I also I forgot to point out that uh, we made this thing so that if you put the light right on the red dot, and then you poke a hole right in the middle of that little pattern, the light should show up in that, in that hole. But sometimes the printing wasn't exactly right. So what you could do is poke that hole with a pencil. You poke a hole right in the middle because you don't want the light someplace else. You want it right in the middle. And then you can actually put the light in there and move it around on the copper and then tape it down on the copper later once the light is in the right place. Because on the bottom here, it doesn't matter where the light is taped. It could be over here, over here, over here, over here. As long as one leg is connecting to that copper and one leg is connecting to that copper. Okay, that's just to make sure your light comes out in the middle. The pattern is pretty cool. It's a, it's a hexagon. Did you notice that? It's a hexagon made of circles. And usually you think hexagons have flat sides but there's nothing flat here at all. It's all circles, but the result is a hexagon. So that's pretty cool. And you can, if they have any kind of colors at all, even like a couple colors, it makes it look really nice. So they can spend a lot of time making it beautiful for their little card. And then they can open it up or they can write something. They can write whatever they want on the inside and send it off to whoever they want. Okay, so uh, bottom line here, uh, you will have a bunch of kids who can't get their card to work. So uh, you flip the LED. No, first of all, you, you try to make sure every connection is good. There's only like four, right? There's the battery, two sides of the battery, two sides of the LED, and then the copper has to go, has to be continuous. If, you, if you're a little bit rougher even than mine, when you turn a corner, you might have ripped the copper and it's not actually touching there. So make sure every corner, the copper is overlapped and it's pushing really hard. If you rip it, it's no problem at all, but you have to start again by pushing it down. There can't be any gaps. 
the copper is actually carrying the electricity just like a wire. So it needs to be a complete circuit. That's like the, the science concept for this one is that uh, electricity travels around a complete circuit. Circuit, that's like circle, right? It's a the complete path from one place all the way around to the other place. Uh, yeah. I think that's it. But this is called uh, troubleshooting. When it when it when you built it, it was supposed to work and it didn't work. Now you you enter the stage of troubleshooting. This is very common. Every computer technician has to learn this. Uh, plumbers have to learn this. Uh, electrical like electrical contractors with a house they have to learn it. When you wire up a house, you turn the electricity on. You have to go try every single thing, and very very often something doesn't work. Maybe a whole room doesn't work. Well, what happened? You got to go figure it out. So they're being engineers, they're being technicians when they try to figure out how their card is not working. You are not responsible for making their card work. They are responsible for making their card work. And so gently convey to them that they can do it. You got to figure out how this thing's not working. I'm not even with you. You got to be there and I'll help you. But this is part of the process. You can do it. Frustration, of course, is the step right before learning, right? <laughs> learning happens best when there's a little frustration. In fact, I often say that the kids who build something and it works right the first time, like they put it together and it works, they didn't get as much. They were not as lucky as the kid who had some problem and had to figure it out and solve the problem. That kid learned more. Okay, uh, I think that's it. I think I don't have anything else to add there. That little battery, yeah, I do I do have something yet. That little battery, a button battery, called a watch battery or button battery, it's got three volts, three volts. If you wanna hook that light up to a bigger battery, like a regular battery, like a double A or triple A, it won't work. It won't, it won't come on because a regular double A or triple A battery, they are um, one and a half volts. One second. You can, you can, you can read on the side of the battery. It says 1.5 V. So that little, that, that thing there, which is a lot bigger than the button battery, that's 1.5 volts. Because the button battery is three volts. Well, what's going on there? How come this little thing's got three volts? And why do we need this big thing? If we get three volts from the little thing, why do you ever need the big one? Any ideas on that? Something to think about. And maybe the kids will ask you that. Uh, I was going to say that uh, it's not going to work if you just put it across this bed. This battery has a negative and positive also. And if you get the LED and just pinch it on there, it doesn't work. Because the LED needs more than two and a half volts before it starts working. So it has to be in the right direction and then it needs two and a half volts at least. So you have to get two of these batteries, get two AA batteries, and then you put it across and it will work. And if you hold them together and tape it on and you have to get another piece of wire because it's not quite long enough, or you could use that copper tape, and then you could, you could connect it on and make it work. It'll work fine. Well, here's the, here's the kicker. If you hooked up two of these AA batteries to your LED, and then you hooked up a little button battery to your LED, and you hooked them up and you, and you taped them on so they're on, which one do you think is going to last longer? The little button battery, the one you put in your card, or the two AA batteries? Which one's going to last long? Which one's going to be on tomorrow when you come back?
Well, uh, you could try it. And uh, you should try it. It's, it's a nice little experiment. Uh, but let me just say that in a battery, there's a chemical reaction happening. Actually, there's two chemical reactions happening. And one chemical reaction is giving electrons and one chemical reaction needs electrons in order to happen. And when you complete the circuit from one side of the battery to the other, then those chemical reactions start going and they start giving electrons and they start running around the circuit and that's electricity and that's making your circuit happen. And at some point, the, uh, the chemical reactions use up all the chemicals in there. And then the battery's dead and the electricity doesn't go anymore. Okay, so the size of the battery determines how many chemicals you can stick in there. The bigger the battery is, the more chemicals are there. So the reaction is gonna happen for a longer time. The voltage is determined by the exact chemical reaction that's happening. Different chemicals, when they react together, they give different voltages. And you can make a teeny, 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 tiny little battery that gives five volts, just because those two elements reacted and give five volts. But it's gonna be dead in three minutes because it's so small, okay? So that's why uh, you use different size batteries. If you want a battery for your big old boom box, you don't want to use a triple A or a double A, you want D cells, right? They all have these giant D cells in them to, uh, so it lasts longer. Okay. That was a lot of physics I just dumped on. I studied physics. I find this stuff pretty interesting. But remember, you don't have to teach that to your kids. I wanted you to to know that just in case you were interested. Uh, but if the kid asked you that and you can't quite remember what I just said, no problem. Repeat the question, give them, give them uh, encouragement to keep on looking for the answer. That's all it takes. Okay. I think that's it. I think that's all I wanted to tell you, say about the card. Any questions about the card? Uh, Curtis, um, mind if I ask, what do you do for a living? I run the Greenfield Community Science Workshop together with Jose. Me and Jose are, are co-directors down here. Uh, and starting in September, I'm going to be at the Salinas Community Science Workshop, which is starting up in the El Salsal Middle School. Oh. And uh, we look forward to continuing working with uh, Alisal Unified, uh, not Unified, Union, Alisal Union, uh, to doing, with doing cool hands-on stuff with kids, both during class and after school. The community science workshop you can you can see if you've never heard of one before you can check out our our uh, umbrella organization website it's a community science workshops.org community science workshops.org uh, i don't have one for the uh the salinas science workshops not not uh got its own website yet but that's our umbrella website and from that, you can find the Greenfield Community Science Workshop website. And you can see all the stuff we do. We work with teachers. We work with uh, after-school programs at different places. We have a mobile science workshop. We have a science mobile, a little, uh, like a mobile museum. And of course, the, the core program is our open door after-school program where the kids come here and they build the projects of their imaginations. So that's what I do. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we got a question from Noemi. What is the main difference between the raft kits and these new kits? More resources available? That's a question for Alicia. Alicia made this possible. Thank you very much. Is she still on here? She was on here. Probably not. She's got better things to do. Uh, 
uh, but um, it's possible. We could do more of this um, next fall or uh, probably not possible this semester, but it's possible. The raft kits, very similar. Uh, I, I know the raft people really well. Raft stuff comes from up in the Bay Area. So this is more homegrown Monterey, Monterey Bay uh, sort of stuff. And, um, and we also can support it better here. It will be nice to be able to showcase our students' work next time we meet. Oh, that's a great idea. That'd be really good. We can collect it. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions, maybe that's it. If you have colleagues or um, staff who you want to see this, I'm going to send out the um, this recording as soon as uh, I get it. Um, uh, what does it do? It, it makes it, and I'll put it up on the on YouTube, and I'll send that link to the assistant principals, so you can have anybody who missed the, the thing today, they could go watch it if they want. It. Okay. I think that's it. If there's no more questions, I'll hang around for a couple more minutes if you do have questions. But uh, happy building. Enjoy yourself. Hope Thank the kids you so are, much. Hope the kids have a good time. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah, you too. I actually have a question. Okay. So, okay. So I have fifth and sixth. So just to sum it up, we really want to encourage for not really give directions for them to just build it on their own. Yeah. Because I will tend to like, you know, step by step. That's right. Yeah. The video and then have them because we already gave them uh, I think we're probably going to start next week or this week maybe on Thursday uh-huh I just wanted to to double check on that I'm like wait <laughs> okay yeah that's great uh I mean they have the uh <clears throat> they have the website on the on the bag they mm -hmm. can uh zap that thing if they know how they can put in the the URL there, or they can look for our um, channel on YouTube. There's three ways to find the, the videos. And, uh, and then once they watch the video, they should be able to do the whole thing themselves. Okay, so, so we're not, so we, we shouldn't do it during after school. It's just kind of guide them to do it on their own at home. Well, no, then you can, you can, um, bring it back you can say okay this wednesday we're going to talk about your stomp rockets all right so everybody do the stomp rockets and bring them on wednesday i want to see what you've done i want to see something that you discovered i want to see what was the system you used to get your rocket to go the farthest or um it, if you have a, some special way that you decorated your rocket everybody bring it and i want to see them all on wednesday and then they all they're all there and then you can start asking them questions about them. You know, how, what did you, what did you find was the best way to make it go further? Or uh, did you have, what was the biggest problem you had, the biggest challenge in building it? Just get a little discussion going about the experience they had. And, and you can also ask them the, the, about how it works. You know, how do you think it works? How's this thing working? Okay. I can do that for my fifth and sixth, but what about the lower grades? Do you, I mean, do you recommend, um, like just showing the video during the class or? Uh, we, we've we done it exactly the same, you know, okay. and maybe they'll, they'll all have more problems, but we found that there's somebody hanging around. A lot of times there's an older brother or sister with nothing better to do than help them. Maybe they're probably not helping them. They probably take over and do it, but then they give it back. And so the, the younger kid can play with it. And, okay. you know, 
that's that's where we are. That's the realities of COVID. You can't micromanage the the learning process. Okay. So um, that's fine. You know, the, the the younger kids are able to do it. We had a a group of uh, preschoolers actually preschoolers doing some of our projects, and most of them had parents or older people helping them. But I was really surprised. They're right in front of their their screens and and here's the project you know somehow or another they got it made <laughs> so. okay so like for example like let's say you know i tell them like work on it over the weekend and then on monday we'll go over it because yeah. we, we kind of like at our school we're thinking of doing it during class mm -hmm. but do you recommend just to kind of you know let them do it on their own like yeah like, well if you if you want to try doing it together as a group mm -hmm. here's what's probably going to happen half the kids are going to be really lagging and they don't understand and they can't get a cam and half the kids are going to you're going to it's going to be all over the place within five minutes okay. and which is fine you know you could do that you could say okay you could stay with me and we'll go step by step or you could just do it you know okay. and you could even try you could have them watch the video before you start, okay. but uh, it it's really hard and kind of ugly if you try to make them stay with you. Now, don't don't do the next step. You know, don't don't tape that on there. You know, who cares? You know, go for it. Put it put it together. See if you can make it work. So that's that's our experience. I just wanted to clear that because I'm very like, okay, we got to do this, this, and this. But uh, I'm like, I'm, thinking, I'm like, okay, because I think you know, I'll probably assign it on the weekend, and my fifth and sixth can, you know, it'll be easier for me instead of just doing it during class and yeah. Have to do, so that's right. Oh. And and who knows? Maybe I mean, if some of your kids don't have any experience building stuff, maybe they'll come on Monday and say, "Oh, I couldn't get it to work," and then and then you say, "Okay, show me what you got," and it's. <laughs> Then when you realize how good their computer, how not good their computer is, they have to put it right there in the camera. And then still, sometimes you can't see what the, yeah. what's going on. Okay. So you just, you know, keep asking them, say, what's going How come it doesn't work? What did you do wrong? What's going um, okay. like on? I know no. we, were thinking, we were talking about like the whole hypothesis, you know, the, um, Okay, what were the results, the conclusion, all of that, especially with the shrimp? Yeah, yeah. You know, but we can even vote as a class and everything, but like you said, so, okay, that'd be so much easier than just do it everybody as a group. But yeah, I'm like, I wanted to ask so many, so many questions, but I, I was never good in science in school. It's like, <laughs> it goes through here and I go through here and I'm just like, uh, what? <laughs> yeah. But I took my notes, so hopefully, wish us the best, and hopefully, you know, they have fun and everything, and we get it done. But. Yeah, well, just uh, just contact me if you have any questions or if you find right. something really interesting. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Right.